With its bent wings and long nose, the U.S. Navy's Corsair was one of the most distinctive American fighters of World War II. It was also one of the fastest. When I flew that thing the first time, I loved it. I think I loved it before I flew it the first time. <laughs> As American forces battled across the Pacific and closed in on Japan, the versatile Corsair earned a fearsome reputation, both as a fighter and as a dive bomber. The Japanese called it whistling death. At sea, carrier-based Corsairs shot down hundreds of deadly kamikaze suicide planes. The Corsair was the right aircraft at the right time and in the right place. Using archive film and color reenactments, heavy metal tells the story of the triumphant role played by the Corsair and its pilots in the Pacific victory of 1945. In the 1930s, the art of war at sea was dominated by the battleship. It was a floating fortress of steel which carried enormous firepower. Some also carried spotter planes that were launched from catapults on deck. Originally, few admirals saw these flimsy contraptions as a serious threat. But as aircraft design steadily improved, they were able to carry a range of increasingly heavy weapons. Soon, even the mightiest battleships became vulnerable to air attack. A new type of warship was created that would transform the war at sea, the aircraft carrier. Although the early biplanes could take off at very low speeds, it was still a risky process. But landing on a carrier was even more dangerous. Pilots needed a lot of training and a lot of nerve. The aircraft would approach the deck trailing a hook Stretched across its path would be a series of arresting wires. When the pilot felt the hook catch a wire, he would cut the power, and his machine would come to an abrupt halt. What a way to land. You can cut, feel that cable get you, and let go, throw your hands out. <laughs> you can't do that in normal flight, landing on a field. It was a crude system, but highly effective. Once that tail hook is caught, there's no other way it can go except down that deck. And no other way it can stop, but it stops damn fast, I'll tell you. Landing an aircraft on a ship is a very difficult proposition. Uh, they call aircraft carrier landings, they jokingly refer to them as controlled crashes. Once the pioneers had perfected the technique, aircraft carriers began operating fleets of torpedo and dive bombers protected by fighters. In 1937, the press services received a flash from Asia. Japan's invasion of China sent shockwaves across the Pacific. Immediately, America launched an urgent review of its defense capabilities. In 1938, the U.S. Navy invited bids for a new type of high-speed, high-altitude fighter designed specifically to operate from aircraft carriers. The winner was the Vought F-4U Corsair, which made its first test flight on the 29th of May, 1940. Soon it became the fastest single-engined aircraft in the world, with a top speed of more than 400 miles per hour in level flight and 500 miles per hour in a dive. The Corsair was highly advanced with folding wings and a huge 2,000 horsepower engine. 
To the pilots who would eventually fly it in World War II, the Corsair looked unlike anything they had ever seen. It was a strange looking bird. It was sort of a monster at that time. It looks like it should be in the air, and in the air, it's so beautiful. Most pilots turned the engine on and took off and flew it, and they didn't think too much about how it was made. The Corsair was a revolutionary machine full of new and advanced technology developed by the Vought Company design team. Those designers, they know what they should be building into that thing, and sometimes they succeed. They're always trying. And when they finally succeed entirely, or as close as they did with the Corsair, that's the epitome. So they had to think about what the part was going to look like, and then think about the machinist that had to take the drawing that somebody had thought about and mix it with all the other parts in there, and they all had to flow together. A lot of things went in there at the first. The R2800 engine, 2,000 horsepower. First engine to produce one horsepower per pound. It drove a 13 foot propeller, the largest yet fitted to a fighter. To keep the undercarriage legs short and strong, the designers kinked the wings downward, creating the head on profile of an inverted seagull in flight. The go wings were designed to raise the airplane up enough that you're large propeller would not hit the ground on takeoff. The outer wing section was hinged and could be folded up over the cockpit to save precious deck space on the carrier. To survive rough treatment at sea, the whole airframe was immensely strong. The airplane was just splendid. It was something we all felt quite lucky to have. While Japan threatened American interests in the Pacific, Adolf Hitler plunged Europe into war. Watching the dramatic events that were unfolding across the world, many Americans believed that they too would soon be at war. It looked as though the Corsair was about to see plenty of action. December 7, 1941. The crime of the century. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor brought the United States into the war. It also showed the world that air power had become the deciding factor in the war at sea. So it's war they want. And throughout the nation, young recruits burning with patriotism rush to enlist. A newer and bigger Navy in the making. My father was a minister in West Liberty, West Virginia. And I enlisted in the Navy V-5 program in June 1942. A Navy recruiting team came around looking for people to go into the flying program. And they had these brochures with beautiful blondes on them. And up. I signed up right away. I said, I want to go in a fighter squadron. I mean, I, after all, that's where the action is. The Corsair was delivered in July 1942. For the first time, young American pilots would actually get to fly it. One day, the operations officer says, hey, bourgeois, it says, your turn to fly. Uh, you take that one out there. And I you know, went out looked at this big bent wing bird. We got the pilot's handbook, and uh, we opened it up, and I just followed what it said. Just the tabs here, and you do this, and turn on the, the master switch, and then the fuel pressure, and then prime the engine, and the whole thing. You hit the start button. And boy, I'll tell you, that thing went pocket to pocket to pocket to run. It was like music, just like music, unbelievable. <laughs> That was probably the biggest thrill I ever had in flying. And I threw that throttle home the first time when that 2,000 horsepower engine threw me in the back seat. I hate to tell
tell you this. It was 5,000 feet before I remembered to pull my landing gear up. It was extremely maneuverable. You know, just a little on a stick, you could roll like mad and uh, climb and do just about anything you wanted. If you love it as much as I do, uh, you believe that you are a part of the airplane and vice versa. And uh, I think that makes a better pilot. If the aircraft is not an extension of yourself, you can fly it, but you will not be a good fighter pilot. The next stop would be the Pacific, where a series of amphibious assaults would be launched against the many Japanese-held islands. Central to the American strategy was the aircraft carrier. The carrier was very important in the Pacific because there's a lot of water and not a lot of land in that theater. So there were a number of missions that the carrier became quite adept at. As the Central Pacific Offensive got started, the carrier became very important in launching close air support strikes to support the ground forces, striking at long range against the enemy fleets, and also neutralizing enemy air power in islands surrounding the area of the assault. The F-4F Wildcat had been the leading American carrier fighter in the early stages of the Pacific War. In June 1942, it played a key role in Japan's first major defeat at sea, the Battle of Midway. Early in 1943, the faster and more powerful F-6F Hellcat was introduced. The Cats were ideal carrier aircraft. They had good forward visibility and handled well, even with battle damage. They were also extremely rugged. But in some combat situations, they were simply outclassed by the Japanese Zero. This lightly built fighter was highly maneuverable, very fast, and extremely dangerous. When the Vought Corsair first arrived in the Pacific, it promised to be more than a match for the Zero. In September 1942, the Corsair began test flights from the deck of an aircraft carrier. But the results were not at all what the Navy had hoped for. Leaking oil smeared the pilot's windscreen and the aircraft's long nose blocked his view during the final stages of a carrier landing. And there were other, more serious problems. It had a very severe uh, stall characteristic in the earlier aircraft because of wing stall. And of course, you have to come pretty slow when you're coming aboard a carrier. So if you got down to that critical point, it would stall like this, and you'd be in the, in the water. Even if the pilot made it back under the ship, a heavy landing would cause the aircraft to bounce wildly along the deck. The tail hook often skipped over the arresting wires without engaging. A lucky pilot could climb away and try another landing. But for most pilots, there was no second chance, as their Corsair tangled with the safety barriers, cartwheeled into the sea, or crashed into other aircraft. After a series of detailed tests, the Navy reluctantly concluded that its new wonder plane was unsuitable for the job it had been designed to perform. The Corsair had the potential to outperform and outgun the Zero, but it needed time to get its sea legs, and the Navy was not prepared to wait. Its fate was sealed. The Corsair would be restricted to land-based operations only. After a promising start, it looked as though the Corsair would play little more than a supporting role in the Pacific theater. But all that was about to change. Henderson Airfield on Guadalcanal is the most hotly contested strip of land in the South Pacific. For five months, the Japs have tried to win back this vital outpost. The Japs call Guadalcanal Death Island. A lot of the early actions in the South Pacific 
uh, were in response to uh, the Japanese threat to Australia. And Guadalcanal was assaulted in August of 1942, and then once that battle was won, the airfields on Guadalcanal became very important in the march up the Solomon's chain. Here, in the humid, uncharted jungles of the South Pacific, the Corsair found a new role. Banished from Navy carriers, the potent new fighter was eagerly adopted by the United States Marine Corps. Corsairs first saw combat in February 1943 and soon began to dominate the air battles in this crucial campaign. The tide was about to turn against the all-conquering Japanese. The Corsair also provided badly needed air support for the hard-pressed Marines on the ground. As they fought their way island by island across the Pacific, they faced a fanatical and determined enemy. Anyone entering actual combat um, is going to be surprised by what they envision combat being like and what it actually becomes. Now, for those uh, GIs and sailors and airmen in the Pacific War, it was a certain degree of savagery that they could have never envisioned uh, with their Japanese enemy. It was different, different than what we thought. And I have a deep respect for the man that's on the ground, and those men suffered hor horribly down there on the ground. Those men, they just did terrific jobs. And sometimes I put myself in their place and I wonder if I could have done what they did. The climate could also be their enemy. Stifling heat, high humidity, and tropical diseases made life in the Solomons a miserable existence for everybody, including the pilots. You lived in your flight suit. You know, you're lucky you had two. Rarely a chance for a bath. I can remember my cloth helmet. You know how you, when you sweat and sweat and you get all this salt out of your body all around you and then your flight suit and it smells like hell. Your socks are always wet. You slept in a, in a cot under a mosquito net. You learn not to sleep right next to the mosquito netting because they loved to work through those holes. I nearly died from malaria twice on uh, Guadalcanal. Their location and their mission were top secret. All mail was censored. Suddenly, the girl back home seemed very far away. Here, they learned to rely on their buddies. And in spite of the harsh conditions, the pilots quickly discovered that in the right hands, the Corsair really was a good fighter. You took off with your canopy open, climbing up the altitude off of Guadalcanal, and you're all sweaty, and you'd cool down. It was heaven. You didn't want to come back down. See that plane? Climbing to heaven like a skyrocket? Heaven's the wrong destination for that baby. That's a zero, the real McCoy. Government training films and Hollywood actors did their bit to help the fighter pilots identify their enemy. I guess there are a couple of things I don't know about this airplane, sir. I'm glad to hear you admit it. That's the beginning of wisdom. In the studio, it was all done by the book. Wings, post to nose. Canopy sits on fuselage. Check. But in actual combat, there was little time for checking. Survival depended on instant reactions. It's a zero check. There's no script yet that says you're going to be killed tomorrow. I says, if you're sharp enough, if you're smart enough, if you're quick enough, uh, if you're attentive enough, uh, you can control your own destiny. You've got guns, they've got guns, and you're trying to kill each other. Most fighter pilots think they're the king of the road. When the chips are down, they'll take on the world. It was kind of like a sport. I'm shooting at them, and they're shooting at me. And I never did think I could get hit. <laughs> Most of us uh, thought we were invincible. Of course, we weren't, but we thought we were. You were aware of what could happen. And you knew that you could get killed. But uh, sit there and worry about it? 
hell no, you haven't got time for that. You've got to get out and do it and be sure you don't get killed. The Japanese pilots were confident, highly experienced, and highly motivated. They had devastated Pearl Harbor and swept across the Pacific, but now they had to contend with the Corsair and its unrelenting breed of fighter pilots. You could turn either direction with ease, and the Japanese Zero couldn't do that. It couldn't turn to the right. So you get in a high-speed dive, if they were on your tail, turn to the right, he couldn't make it, and he'd go on by, and you turn back and say, oh, look what I found. <laughs> and that was the end of him. There was a zero not a, oh, 200 feet right there, just dead eye right there. And I just blasted him, it blew up. My first actual kill was off of Guadalcanal, and the first fight in the uh, Corsair got into a pretty good tangle. I had a flight of eight, and they had a flight of 16. We actually decimated them. I got five by myself in that one fight. With five kills to his credit, Archie Donahue joined the elite group of pilots claiming the unofficial title of Fighter Ace. The Corsair was steadily carving out a new reputation for itself, not as a temperamental rookie, but as a seasoned campaigner and a highly effective fighter. One of the most successful Marine squadrons was VMF 214, led by a tough and aggressive commander, Major Greg Boyington. Boyington had a reputation as a hard-drinking, hard-fighting individualist with little time for the rule book. Known as Rats, he was 30, an old man in the eyes of his young pilots. When he formed the squadron, they renamed him Pappy. We thought we ought to have a squadron name. So everybody's sitting around drinking and singing, and, and they decided that we ought to be called Boyington's Bastards. And uh, Frank Walton says, no, 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 you can't put that in the, in the paper. They finally settled on a name which the newspapers could print, the Black Sheep. And their exploits certainly made good copy. During their first combat mission on September 16, 1943, Boyington claimed five enemy aircraft, gaining the ultimate status of becoming an ace in a day. The press reports coming back from the Solomons with uh, uh, Boyington and Bolt and uh, Bourgeois and all these, uh, uh, these Marine uh, fighter pilots would, just really captured the uh, public imagination. And a lot of it really came down to Boyington himself, who wasn't exactly a poster boy Marine by any stretch of the imagination. He bent the rules and regulations on numerous occasions, but as far as a skilled combat pilot and really a skilled combat leader in the air, uh, he was tough to match. Boynton was the leader, and he was scared of nothing, and he would talk to the Japanese over their frequency, and they would talk to him, and we heard all of those stories. One time, uh, Boynton went up there, and they wouldn't come off the ground, and uh, he yelled over the radio, come on up and fight, come on up and fight. And then the Japanese would come up, and it just became a big fighting melee. He was always lecturing us about if you go in combat, you, what you want to do is you're going to pick out one airplane and kill it. He says, don't, don't care about anything else, just kill that airplane. And he said, you got to be very aggressive. And he was very aggressive. He was the best pilot I've ever known. As a, and I, I would fly with him in combat anytime, anyplace, anywhere. The bitter air battles over the Solomons marked a turning point in the Pacific War. From now on, Japan would be on the defensive. As the battle-hardened pilots who had devastated Pearl Harbor were steadily picked off, their poorly trained replacements proved to be no match for the Americans. As a land-based fighter, the Corsair was clearly a winner. 
but it was about to be transformed into an even more powerful and lethal weapon, as the Japanese would soon discover. In the airstrips that had been hacked out of the jungles, the air forces gave the infantry the one thing they lacked for so long, air ground support. During 1944, the Marines carried out a series of ordnance loading tests on the Corsair. They found that the rugged aircraft could safely carry more than one and a half tons of bombs and rockets hung beneath the wings and fuselage. Now the Corsair took on a new and devastating role as America's first true fighter bomber. Meanwhile, halfway across the world, the idea of the Corsair as a viable aircraft carrier fighter was about to be resurrected. It was designed to go to sea, but it took the British to prove it actually could. The fleet air arm of Britain's Royal Navy saw the fighter's potential and found ways to correct most of its faults. They gave them to the British thinking, they, well, let those limeys worry about it, you know. And they worried about it because they fixed it. The Royal Navy played a great role in the Corsair's development because it was actually the first service to consistently operate the Corsair from the carrier. Corsairs were operating from Royal Navy flat tops eight months before they were routinely operated from American carriers. The British pilots could not solve the Corsair's problem of poor forward visibility. But by approaching the carrier in a long, gentle curve, they kept the deck in view until the very last moment. Finally, in January 1945, eight months after the British had mastered the art, America also sent the Corsair back to sea. Where the Marines were able to get back in the fight, so to speak, and bring their Corsairs back into the fight was when they were put aboard ship in uh, 1944, 1945. And it was sort of a unique evolution in that Marine squadrons operated as part of Navy air groups aboard the large fleet carriers. But the Marines were taking on a tough assignment. The first task was to master the delicate art of taking off and landing on a carrier. The LSO landing signal officer says, OK, I think he's competent to go ahead and give it a shot. And then you give him the nod and bang, off you go. See, boy, what a jolt that is. It was lots of fun to take off the first time. You scared to death, but. Uh, and you'd be telling a story if you were not. Then you start your turn to come around uh, and get lined up and come aboard. As you make your approach for carrier landing, the landing signal officer is your eyes and your brains. And you're looking at him, see, all the time. And he's standing there with these gizmos. And he's telling you, you're too low or come up to here. Too high, too low, too fast, too slow. And then if you're not going to make it, he'll give you a wave off. So I came around first to land. I couldn't get lined up. I got waved off. If you're slow, he'll give you a come on. Just add your power a little bit and come on. If you're satisfactory to him in the approach, he'll throw his paddle across his chest. That's when you pull the power off, dump your nose, pull the nose back, and, and catch a wire. You fly in a constant turn on the approach. And that man is standing in that dip in the wing, and you can just see him as plain as hell while you're coming around like this. And all you have to do is keep him in sight, and then he cuts, and you're on the deck. But nothing could guarantee a safe landing on a carrier. Even the experienced Navy pilots flying their faithful Wildcats and Hellcats still met with disaster. There are lots of accidents on carrier landings. It's a very delicate situation, really. It is very risky. There's always that danger of fire. As he lands, the belly tank catches on fire with the pilot trapped in the cockpit. Miraculously living through the inferno, the pilot is helped to safety. Carefully, his gear is removed before doctors treat him. After only nine days at sea, 
the first two Marine squadrons had lost seven pilots and 13 Corsairs, mostly due to accidents on the flight deck. Land-based Navy squadrons were also put on board carriers with equally mixed results. But eventually, most pilots learned to tame the high-spirited Corsair. It was always a little bit, but you got the technique. You got the technique, and you're able to do it. It became, it became just a routine thing. Stand by to take aircraft aboard. Stand by to take aircraft aboard. It won't be easy for this one. That wheel up. This hydraulic system's gone. One wheel landing sober you up. When they don't kill you. Each day in life is like a carrier landing. If you can walk away from it, you're in good shape. Keeping the aircraft in fighting trim was a full-time job. Battle damage and landing accidents meant a steady workload for the army of mechanics who worked night and day on the hangar deck. Undamaged aircraft had to be serviced and checked every day. Everything had to be ready for the next mission. Just one overlooked detail could spell disaster. You go jump in your car, you don't worry about whether you got a flat tire or there's enough oil. And it can, you just get in and you expect it to go, and that's, uh, you eventually get to that point, which is not good on an aircraft. But I think a lot of us pilots did that. Those guys would work all night long. They would, um, you know, have to swap wings and tails and engines and propellers and patch holes. And I really admire them. I really do. They are proud of their airplane, too. They're doing everything they can to keep the thing looking good and performing properly. Your life was in their hands, and uh, they were dedicated, uh, wonderful guys. When you took off with their aircraft, they went with you. And when you came back, they were happy. By the start of 1945, the Americans were advancing on all fronts. The Naval Task Force that closed in on Japan was the most powerful ever assembled. They were from horizon to horizon. Warships, it's unbelievable. Carriers and battleships and cruisers and I just couldn't believe there were that many. I thought the Japanese were going to have a difficult time from then on. And they did. We are being attacked. But as the net closed around Japan, resistance grew more determined. For the first time, the Corsair pilots were about to face attacks from an enemy with a terrifying mindset. No surrender, whatever the cost. Action stations. Jap suicide pilots attempt to crash their planes into our ships. By the spring of 1945, Japan's key weapon had become the kamikaze suicide attack. To the Americans, the life of a trained pilot was far too precious to waste. Now they found themselves confronting an enemy who actually wanted to die. It was a terrifying and incomprehensible situation. It's altogether different from what you would think a human being would want to do is preserve his life, but that wasn't the case. I got a kamikaze on the flight deck about 150 feet ahead of me. It was a scary experience. All the pilots were in the ready room. If they'd been back 150 feet or so, it had wiped out all the pilots on the ship. For them, it was such an honor that they loved to kill themselves, and, and, and that's a beastly thing to try to, to stop. I know they'd have a hell of a time convincing me to go dive into a Japanese carrier. I'd go, I'd 
fly down the flight deck, got all the guns going, or I'd drop a couple of bombs on it. But how am I going to fly into it? It was not for freedom or democracy or home and family that the Japanese airmen chose to die. Their suicide mission was a final act of devotion to their divine ruler, Emperor Hirohito. I think it, it cut back their total ability to some extent. If you can believe that you've got a chance and you're a human being, you're wanting to live. They're getting rid of an airplane when they take off and, and they're getting rid of themselves. And uh, I think it's a negative situation. But even the ultimate sacrifice of the kamikazes could not stop the American advance across the Pacific. By April 1945, there was only one island left to invade before Japan itself. Okinawa, strategic link in the Ryukyu chain, an island strong point in the southern defense system guarding the Japanese mainland. On L Day, April 1st, 1945, it is the assigned mission of the amphibious force. As the battle for Okinawa raged, the kamikaze attacks on the American fleet reached their climax. But the Corsair gave the carrier force a crucial advantage as the American pilots decimated their fanatical opponents. You couldn't understand them any way, shape, or form, except you just had to kill them or they'll kill you. It was just something you had to do. I'd want to be furious at the enemy. I'd cuss him out. That way I could stay really aggressive and madder that I was scared. I set my tracers uh, well ahead of his nose. Then I just walked them back toward the airplane. And you know that suddenly he blew up. The last fight I ever got into, we had 16 airplanes opposing us on Okinawa. And uh, I got five of them, and we, we got all of those guys. But the American casualties were also heavy. Aircraft often had to attempt a landing with vital controls shot away. The carrier aircraft were most vulnerable to kamikazes when tightly packed on the flight deck, awaiting the call to action. It makes you pretty nervous when you're sitting there. You can't move, and you wonder where that next sucker's going to go. Their target was the middle of the aircraft on board, and that's where I was. I looked around. <laughs> we had the Ticonderoga right off our port side. But one Jap gets through, crashing on the deck of the Ticonderoga. Out of the peripheral vision, I saw this explosion. I looked over. At that moment, the airplanes, pieces and parts and whatever were everywhere. They hit right in the middle of that pack. Another carrier in the thick of the action was the Bunker Hill. Archie Donahue had just returned with his flight from a long, uneventful patrol. I canceled the briefing. I had 16 pilots out that, this mo that morning, and uh, 15 of us went down to get some rest and bunk. A few get through, and one Jap pilot aims his plane at the carriers. Missing one ship, he heads for the Bunker Hill stern. Two kamikazes dived in and broke through to the hangar deck where airplanes were stacked inside, some of them fueled. It created one hell of a fire. You wouldn't believe that that ship could survive. Fires fed by ammunition spread rapidly, but were fiercely fought as other crewmen rescued the wounded. One man stayed to write his wife a letter. And when those two kamikazes hit us, they hit near our ready room, and, and he was killed. Uh, instantly, they told me. Uh, and uh, he was the only one I lost in my flight. 
Archie's decision to cancel the briefing had saved the lives of all but one of his pilots. But many others did not escape. Almost 400 men on the Bunker Hill were killed. Miraculously, she managed to stay afloat, but her fighting days were over. The grim battlefield of Okinawa, where one of the bloodiest engagements of the war is being fought. Thousands of Yanks have sacrificed their lives to drive a fanatical foe from this vital base, the doorstep to Japan itself. As the fighting reached its bloody climax, Corsairs pounded the Japanese defenses with a sinister new weapon, the jellied gasoline known as napalm. After almost three months of bitter fighting, American forces conquered Okinawa, but at a terrible price. Okinawa had cost 12,000 Allied lives and at least 125,000 Japanese were killed. Here you see the propensity of the Japanese to dig in and you have to root them out cave by cave. And you see that an assault against Japan and just multiplying Okinawa by 10, 20 fold is going to be a very costly endeavor. And certainly that is a factor in the decision to drop the atomic bombs. On August 6, 1945, the world's first atomic bomb devastated the city of Hiroshima. After a second bomb on Nagasaki, the Japanese finally accepted defeat. The atomic age would herald in the jet age but the Corsair had taken the propeller-driven fighter to the very limit of its ability. After many setbacks, the Corsair became accepted as the finest, most versatile fighter-bomber of its day. For the young men who took it to war, flying the bent-wing bird was an unforgettable experience. People ask me, was I scared? during the war, was I afraid? I never was. You know, I was 21 years old. Man, it was fun, it was a game. You were alone in that cockpit, and your destiny pretty much was right there in these two hands on this stick. I sometimes fly aircraft in my sleep a little. I've done that all of my life. Flying's so beautiful to me, it's like, being an angel, you have advantages that are unbelievable and views of the world that are marvelous. I love it. I'm on a quest across the U.S. to find out how the states got their shapes. Oh, mountains. Why does Michigan have an upper peninsula that looks like it belongs to Wisconsin? A lot of people are having trouble with this. How the states got their shapes. Tonight at 8.